All right. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. I want you all to look around, church. Look how many people are in this room. It's not by happenstance. In fact, the, we, we read about things such as revival and reformation. And we also read about evangelism. But the misnomer is evangelism and revival are not synonyms. Revival is the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And evangelism is the work of the church in the community. You never have to advertise a fire. And when a church is on fire, people will come running. Revival fires, what do they do though? When something's on fire, they wanna, we want to put the fire out with water. But Holy Spirit, when it comes into the church, the church is on fire and it brings the latter rain. And that follows. We see people gathering around this church because the presence, the presence of God is here. Today, I took a long time over the last couple of weeks thinking about what I should speak on today. What would be appropriate for the church today? What is, given the nature and the spiritual con condition, the way we have grown, the conversations we have had, I wanted to choose a special message, and it's one I've never spoken on here before. So the title of today's sermon is, He Took, He Blessed, He Broke, and he gave. And we're going to be looking at the text in Mark chapter 6 and Mark chapter 8 regarding this sequence of events. Before we go there, I wanted to point some things out uh, for our understanding so we can better appreciate the truth that God has. In Hebrews 13, which is the book concerning the new covenant and Christ as our priest, it says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blank of the everlasting covenant. Does anybody know the word that is used here in this passage? What does God use of the everlasting covenant to make you perfect in every good work to do his will? The key word here is actually the blood. It was the blood of the everlasting covenant that gave it its power. It was the currency of the covenant to be established. And in this approach, there are actually covenant rules and regulations. And on your own time, I would encourage you to read Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 32, titled The Two Covenants. It's a very fascinating, complete, systematic explanation of how the Old and the New Covenant work together in the Bible. And you will be quite surprised... Uh, mainstream Christianity has a very incorrect understanding of the, the two covenants. Uh, what is commonly taught is not true at all. But that's not the point of this sermon, but I do encourage you to read Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 32. When we're looking at these covenants, there are laws in the New Testament as well. Galatians 3 and verse 15. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can cancel or change a human covenant that has been duly established. So it is in this case in reference to the new covenant that Jesus had confirmed. So the first rule of the covenant or attestment is once it's been established, can it be changed? Can it be canceled? No. So how then does a covenant become established? In Hebrews 9, 16 and 17, we see how this rule is applied. And this is one actually used by judiciary courts around the world. For where a testament is, there must also be of necessity the death of the what? Testator. Who is a testator? The person who wrote the will, correct? You have a will and testament before you die. You have to write a testament. But when is your will invoked to be enforced when you die it says in verse 17 for the testament is of force only after men are dead otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth isn't that interesting do you know the new covenant was given to adam and eve in the book of genesis so the new covenant is actually older than the old covenant but the stating or the classification of the covenants is classified based on when the death of the agreed-upon testator was made. 
The old covenant was considered the old or the first covenant because the blood of that covenant, which was the killing of the animals, occurred first. So the old covenant was confirmed first. However, in terms of strict time existence, the new covenant existed before it. And so the new covenant was not confirmed until who died? Jesus. So that's when the new covenant was established, when the blood of that testator was applied. So the new covenant is older than the old covenant, but it was not confirmed until after the old covenant, which is why it's called new. Does that make sense? The old covenant was given at Sinai, which received the blood sacrifices at Sinai. But the new covenant did not receive the death of its testator until when? Calvary. And so the other rule is, if you're going to add or change your covenant, when does the testator have to change it? Before he dies. Do you know people who argue that Jesus changed the Sabbath from Sunday are arguing on the wrong side of the cross? Because what do they say? Oh, he died and resurrected on the first day, therefore we can keep the first day. They're saying after he died, that allowed the covenant to be changed. That defies the entire logic of a covenant. Amen. Amen. This was an argument used by our pioneers in the 1800s. I read that from Stephen Haskell. And so it's something we should be mindful of. They violate the entire existence of what a covenant is by definition. Because before Jesus died, there is not one verse in the entire Bible where he changes his covenant. Amen. And so they have to use confusing semantics from Paul, which are completely out of context, to try to make their point. Amen. But that's not, this, this isn't a Sabbath semantic sermon, but for your information, it's quite intelligent. It's quite fascinating. So here, Christ, Acts of the Apostles, page 14, paragraph 1. Christ was the foundation of the Jewish economy. The whole system of types and symbols was a compacted prophecy of the gospel, a presentation in which were bound up the promises of redemption. So when Christ came, he was transitioning the economy from this old covenant system to this new covenant. And he knew that when he died, whatever was standing would be set in stone. So he had to implement or reiterate things he wanted people to remember. He actually talks about three things while he was alive that were important to him. Number one, he, important, he reiterated the importance of the law of God. And he reminded everyone of the seventh day Sabbath. All through the Gospels, he talks about the Sabbath. Even in Matthew 24, he says, do not, he says, remember the Sabbath and that you would not have to flee on the Sabbath day in the day of your persecution. The other thing is he implemented the ordinance of baptism. And lastly, he implemented the ordinance of communion. And we are familiar with the communion text, but today I want to show you all something absolutely fascinating, I think, about the communion in the Gospel. We are told in Spirit of Prophecy, Evangelism 273.2, and there's the original quote from Manuscript 27, the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars. It's the only time she gives monumental pillars a title for two, which they represent. There are all these pillars, the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the sanctuary, but she says the only two that are monumental in nature is baptism and communion. And so there's something significant about these pillars that has to do with your salvation. One within the church and one without the church. So baptism is for those on the outside coming in and those who are in the church are to partake of the communion. You, you, it, is, it was never biblically appropriate for someone to partake of a communion who had not been baptized. Upon these ordinances, Christ had inscribed the name of the true God. So today, we're going to find out about what it means when it says, He took, He blessed, He broke, and He gave. This is a, a, a summation image of the Gospel of Mark. And Jesus' ministry is kind of set up in three phases over the first, second, and third year of His life. Here, He's kind of rising, coming out of obscurity, you know, cleansing of the temple, the wedding ceremony. Over here, it's at the height of his popularity. This is in the middle of Mark, uh, chapters 3 to 7. 
This is where he performs the miracles and the feeding the 5,000 uh, Galileans. And he kind of, he travels across into the land of Perea and Tyre, and he feeds the 4,000 Gentiles. And then he comes back into Judea. And this is in the closing scenes of his history. And here is the, the, the week of passion, the crucifixion week. And so there was kind of three segments to Christ's ministry that we see when we look at it from an aerial perspective. And I want us to keep this image in mind as we go forward. In Mark chapter 6, verses 32 to 34, we read the event of him feeding his first great miracle on a grand scale. And it says, And they parted into a desert place by a ship privately, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot there out of all the cities. And they followed him and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw many people and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them, having uh, many things to say. So this is while he is in Galilee. And here it comes to this point where it says, Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and to buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And he said, answered and said unto his disciples, Give you them to eat. And they said unto Jesus, Shall we go and buy $200 worth of bread and give them to eat? And Jesus said unto them, Well, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, five loaves and two fishes of bread. So they had been with Jesus. He was on the outside of town. They had been in the desert. He was preaching for three days, and they had not eaten. Imagine a three-day sermon, and you're not allowed to eat or drink. But you're sitting at the feet of the master, and he realizes you're famished, and he's moved with compassion. So he tells his disciples, We'll go and feed them. And they were so eager in this moment. They said, we'll even spend our own money. Just tell us what to buy. They wanted to feed their brothers and sisters. But Jesus says, don't spend your money. Tell me how many loaves you brought with you to the, in your lunchbox. And they said, five loaves and two fishes. And so Jesus commanded them to make all of the people sit down in companies upon the green grass. And they did sit down in ranks in rows of 50 by 100, so like a, tri uh, a rectangle, rows of 50 by 100. And then he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, and he looked unto heaven, and he blessed, and he brake the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes he divided among them all. So he took, he blessed, he brake, and he gave the bread and the feeding of the 5,000. And they did eat, and they did all eat, and they were filled. And they took up how many baskets? 12. They started out with five, and they ended with 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And straight away he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, where he set where he sent away the people. So he feeds the 5,000 in Galilee, and he's looking over on the coastline, and he sees the Gentile cities on the other side of the river. And he says, we have to go over there now. And we have to do something for them on the other side of the river. All right, remember the numbers. Every number is significant in this story. So Mark chapter 7 is this interlude, because the miracle to the Gentiles is in chapter 8. And so between those, we have this kind of like intermission. And before the next day comes when he feeds the 4,000, he's at somebody's house. And when they, they were at the borders of Tyre and Sidon, these are all like Gentile cities. These aren't strictly Jewish. And he entered into a house and would have no man know it. But he could not be hidden, for a certain woman whose younger daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at Jesus' feet. And the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and give it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. I just think that is so significant. We're going to find out what that means. Verse 
29, and Jesus said unto her, for this saying, go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come unto her house, her house, she found the devil was gone, and her daughter laid upon the bed and was healed. So Jesus heals the Gentile woman's daughter by faith. But he says, I had to feed the children first. And she said, but the dogs still eat the crumbs from off the children's table. And she was a Greek woman. So we'll come back to that. Now, in Mark chapter 8, we read about the second great miracle. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called unto his disciples and said unto them, I have compassion on this multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from afar. So these Gentile people sat for three days, had nothing to eat just as persistent. And Jesus also had compassion upon them. But now watch this. Notice the response of the disciples. And his disciples answered him, from where can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven loaves. So the disciples weren't as eager to feed the Gentiles who were not like them. They didn't offer to spend their savings account. They didn't offer to go into the market and buy bread. They didn't even offer a solution. They said, how are we going to feed them in the wilderness? We're not going to go out of our way to do it. Just two chapters ago, Jesus fed 5,000 people. They didn't even expect Jesus to perform a miracle, to feed the dogs. It's interesting. Jesus asked, well, how many loaves do you have? Seven. How many loaves did they have in Jerusalem? Five. How many loaves were left over in Mark 6? Twelve. How many loaves did they have in the Gentile land? Seven. All right. And Jesus commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and blessed and broke and gave to his disciples to set before them, and they did sit, and they did sit them before the people. Same four verbs done by Jesus. He took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave unto the Gentiles. In Mark chapter 8, verses 7 and 9, And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to sit them also before them. So they did eat, and they were filled. And they took up the fragments that was left. How many baskets? Seven. So they started with seven and ended with seven. The Jews started with five and ended with 12. And they that had eaten were about how many? 4,000. So you have seven and seven and 4,000. You have five and 12 and 5,000, right? Okay, we're getting somewhere. Now at the end of these miracles, Jesus is like, okay, let's kind of have a little meeting. And he says, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they any in the ship with them no more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because it is because we have no bread? And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, Why reason you because you have no bread? Perceive you not yet, neither understand? Have you your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves among the 5,000 and had many baskets full of fragments took up, taken up? Yet they said unto him, Twelve. He took up twelve. We remember, Lord. And when the seven among the 4,000, how many were left? Seven. We remember, Lord. So they were like, well, yeah, we remember what you did. And this was Jesus' reply. He said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? So the question today is, after hearing that gospel presentation of those miracles, do you not understand what was going on here? So let's see if we can find some understanding. Five loaves in Galilee. The five loaves. The five represents grace in the Bible. In the covenant made with Abram, there were five sacrifices to signify this transaction as pure favor on God's part. 
When God changed, Ab changed Abram's name, he did so by inserting the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, H, denoting his name Abraham, the number of grace. When God had confirmed the covenant of grace with Abram, he became Abraham, and the Jews knew by his name he had the covenant of grace with him. David chose five stones, four smooth stones plus the one that was sufficient. We are told, my grace is sufficient for thee. 2 Corinthians 9.12 I would rather speak five words in understanding than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. 1 Corinthians 14.9 Grace is a symbol of our understanding of our salvation. A few words spoken in the wisdom of God will accomplish more than the great speeches without the power of God in them. It was God's covenant of grace that he called forth his fivefold demand to Pharaoh to let his people go in Exodus 5. The sanctuary is a symbol of redemptive grace and is marked by five more than any other vesture in the Old Testament. There were 60 pillars built in the construction of the tabernacle. That is five by 12 or grace in governmental display before the world. The pillars that held up the curtains inside were five cubits tall and five cubits apart. Between each pillar hung a white garment by with five by five foot cubit dimensions, symbolizing man must, must be clothed with the garments of Christ's righteousness to enter into a sanctuary. You are saved by grace through faith. The priest enters into the holy place through the atonement of the daily sacrifice who shed its blood on the altar of burnt offering, which was five cubits square. It was five by five by five. The anointing oil for the high priest was made of five ingredients, four different spices plus the oil. Each place was anointed on the high priest, representing the five, um, five senses of man. The right ear symbolized the five senses to be dedicated to God. The right thumb, one of five digits, signifying all the priest was to do and to act for God in service to him. And the right toe of the priest, one of five toes, signifying that the priest would walk in all the precepts of the Lord. The Jews in Mark chapter 6 sat in ranks of 50 by 100 as Jesus walked among them. These were the dimensions of the earthly sanctuary. The sanctuary was 50 cubits by 100 cubits, and they sat in the formation of a sanctuary. When Abraham killed the five sacrifices, they would divide the bodies in half, and he would walk through the sacrificed bodies, showing that he would agree to the terms of the covenant with God. Here Jesus lays out the Jews in the formation of a sanctuary and walks between them confirming his covenant with them. You know that was the prophecy in Daniel 9 that he would confirm the covenant with many for one week. They were all filled in Mark chapter 6 and verse 42. The word for filled is tortezo or to gorge oneself, to be fully satisfied. Jesus never turns away one person. Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, Matthew 5, 6. Not one was turned away who didn't first hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now here's where it gets interesting. They took up 12 full baskets of fragments. Jesus was feeding the Jews here at the end of the miraculous feeding. 12 baskets remained at the feeding of the Jewish people. 12 represents the sons of Jacob who became the 12 tribes of Israel. There are 12 foundations of gemstones in the New Jerusalem which hold the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament given to Israel that prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Jesus first spoke to the Jewish rabbis in the temple at the age of 12, the age of accountability in the Bible. Jesus chose 12 disciples. 12 spies go to the land, go to uh, the city of Canaan before the rest of Israel was allowed to scout in the promised land. The tree of life in Revelation bears 12 fruits for the healing of the nations. The baskets in Mark chapter 6. The Greek word here is kofinos, meaning a small Jewish bread basket. These baskets were handmade by the Jews and it represented their rich culture as it was a part of their identity as a people. These baskets were full with bread. By the full baskets, Jesus is saying, unless your baskets are filled with the bread, which is Christ, then all you have are empty baskets. Baskets for us symbolize our beliefs, our doctrines, our pillars of our faith, but unless Christ is at the center of what we teach and believe, all we are left with are empty baskets. We are told in Gospel Workers 315, paragraph 2, the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truth clusters. 
in order to rightly understand and to be appreciated every truth in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. The baskets were full of fragments. The Greek word here is the same word translated as remnant. There was 12 remaining remnants at the end of the miracle. Jesus is showing that there is enough of him to go around to even feed the remnant who is to come later when he is no longer here on earth. He knows the remnant must also be fed. 5,000 were fed by the first miracle, symbolized that the door of probation had not yet closed on the Jewish people. Christ was still trying to show them he was the Messiah. As Christ pleaded with them, so did God teach the same lessons of grace to Abraham. Jesus walks among the 5,000 as Abraham bargains with God, starting and ending with the symbols of grace for the sinful Sodom and Gomorrah. He decreases his plea by increments of five in Genesis chapter 18. First 50, then 45, then 40, and he counts all the way down until five. And God is willing to save down to the fifth, which is a symbol of his grace that he was willing to save to the uttermost, as long as it would not defile his grace. God confirms they, the covenant with Abraham in symbols of five. Jesus is showing the 5,000 he is here to do the same with them regarding the new covenant that God did with Abraham in the old covenant. The new covenant wasn't just for the Christians. He would have confirmed it with the Jews had they accepted him. This was why he first went to the children and not the dogs. In Leviticus 26, it says, And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand to flight, but your enemy shall fall before you by the sword. God's grace was sufficient for them to conquer their enemies, even though they were outnumbered. He says, I will establish my covenant with you, and I will walk among you. Christ was showing that he was willing to save the Jews, even while on the earth. Now, as we look at Mark chapter 7, Jesus passes over into Gentile territory. And this is where he begins his ministry to the Gentiles, where we saw that change of that ministration for him on earth. His first miracle here was to the Gentile woman whose daughter was demon-possessed. In Mark 7, 27, Jesus says, Let the children first be filled, for it is not fair to feed the dogs first. The children represented the reason why Jesus first spent time ministering to the Jews in Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Galilee. But Jesus blessed the Greek woman for her faith in her reply, Yes, yet... Lord, the dogs eat under the table of the children's crumbs. Her faith pointed to the mystery of God being finished. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, we read, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby you read now, that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The mystery of God was that the Gentiles could be fellow heirs and partakers of the body of Christ, and that there would be enough of him to go around to feed them also. And that this was the finishing. This will be the ministry of God should be finished that we read about in Revelation 11. This is the finishing work of the third angel's message when the seventh trumpet should begin to sound. That is when the Gentiles will be made fellow heirs and be partakers in the body of Christ as his bride. This is what Christ is working for us now to achieve. When he was feeding them, he was moved with compassion to feed the Gentile multitude because they had stayed with him three days in the wilderness. Even the days they tarried with him are symbolic. They had been with him three days without food. Three is symbolic in scripture and here is applied to the Gentiles who troubled Israel. There was darkness in the land of Egypt for three days in Exodus 10 and verse 22. So three represented a time of darkness in Egypt. The Israelites had a three days journey from the Red Sea to where they had their first encounter with Christ in the wilderness at the Mara, where he, the, water, the rock was hit and turned, water came out of the rock. The Mara 
was the first trial that Israel had to come to out of being cleansed from Egyptian bondage for three days. The mare here, the M-A-R-A-H, is a similar word used for the word mare vision in Daniel chapter 8. The mare and the mara are conjoined words. The mare in the vision is a reflection, like looking in the water and seeing a reflection. But the mara with the A-H is the literal thing that casts the figure or the shadow. And so when the rock was struck, remember what happened to Moses? He struck it how many times? Twice. And what happened? That was that, that he sealed his death by striking the rock twice because he was only supposed to hit it once. Because what did that rock at Marais represent? The body of Christ that would redeem Israel. And how many times was Jesus supposed to die? Once. Striking the rock twice was sinful because it, it defiled that Christ was not to die once but twice, and that was wrong. So Moses had to be killed at 120. He could not enter into the promised land because he had to pay. The second striking was a second death, and so he had to die and pay the death toll for that disobedience. And the Mara is the literal Christ, and the Mare vision in Daniel 8 is the vision of Christ's reflection cleansing the sanctuary that Daniel saw in Daniel 8. <clears throat> Jesus noticed the hunger of the Gentiles, not his disciples, like they did in Mark 6 for the Jewish friends, so Jesus asked for their food. They, they weren't so y yippy to feed the Gentiles as they were to feed the Jews, their buddies. And so this is interesting here. This time the disciples only had seven loaves. Jesus says in Luke 6:38, "Give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour into your lap. For by you, by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return." God's people would never lack resources to resources to do what he calls them to do if they trusted his promises. They were more than willing to give of what they had to feed the Jews. They started with 5 and ended with 12 as a 220% return on their investment. They were stingy and selfish and refused to give what they had, and they had a one-to-one -one return in feeding the Gentiles. They had no b blessing in feeding them. There was nothing else left over except what they started with. But the seven also means other things. Jesus was teaching them the lesson of spiritual investment. When the disciples gave all they had to Jesus and then helped him to give it away to others, they had seven full baskets remaining for themselves. We are told by Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. So why seven loaves of bread for the Gentiles? Does that, only, does that not represent the Jews? Is that not a spiritual number? Why is seven associated with feeding the Gentile nations? Actually, it's a fulfillment of prophecy and it was required that the law would be fulfilled. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, it says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou go to possess it, so it's the Gentile land, and hast cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Pizzerites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before you, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, and thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show them any mercy. There were seven pagan nations that constantly attacked the Israelites. And in the end, God says, I will give you victory over the Gentile nations, and you will be delivered, because I will establish my covenant with you and not the dogs. But when the Christ had come to establish the new covenant, it was to include the Jews and the Gentiles. And the seven loaves of bread represents the feeding of the seven Gentile nations that would make up the rest of the population of the world that were first mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Jesus was preparing to establish his covenant of grace, and if he was going to incorporate more than just the Jews, Jesus had to make it known that there was enough bread for the Gentile nations too. 
This is why he took the seven loaves and fed the Gentiles. So they did eat and the Gentiles were filled. The same word used here for the Gentiles, they were fully satisfied. Now, what's interesting is the baskets were different. The Greek word for baskets is different. In feeding the Gentiles, the seven baskets of bread that were left over, the Greek word is spurus, whereas the, the word for the Jews was the kofinos. So it was the same basket that's actually used later on by when Paul was in Greece, and they had to lower Paul over the city of the wall in a spurus basket. And these baskets were gigantic. Paul climbed into the basket and it lowered him over the wall of a city. So these Greek baskets, they weren't messing around. They were massive. So there's something to think about. Why were the Jewish baskets small? What did that mean? And why were the Greek baskets so big? And what did that mean? I believe it means the Jews would reject Christ, that they would, their baskets had no more room to accept him whereas the Greek baskets were full and they were re waiting to be filled and they could contain much more. Also, what's very interesting here, the seven large Greek baskets full with bread represented the work that would be completed by the Gentiles who would later become known as Hebrew Christians and later Protestants and later still Seventh-day Adventists. This is the first time in the Bible that Jesus applies his seal of seven upon a Gentile nation whom he was moved to compassion for. Seven represents spiritual perfection. It is the Hebrew word Shiva. It is from the root E, meaning to be full or satisfied or to have enough of. Hence the word Shivath or to rest or to Sabbath. Another meaning of Shavath is to swear or to make an oath. Its first occurrence is used in Genesis 21, where a covenant was made using seven sacrificial lambs. Here in Mark 8, Jesus is showing the Gentiles that the atonement he is going to make to establish the new covenant gives him the legal right to save both Jews and non-Jews alike, where grace and forgiveness would be provided for everyone that repents. The seven Greek baskets of bread symbolize the extension of the sevenfold Abrahamic blessing in Genesis 12 to the whole world. There are seven promises given to the Israelites in Genesis 12. I will bring you out from under Egyptian bondage. Remember, they had to come out of Egypt and cleanse themselves for three days from the sin of Egypt until they arrived at the Marah. I will rid you of the burden of the place placed upon you by sin. I will redeem you. I will bring you unto me as a people. I will be to you a God. I will bring you into the land of the promised land, and it will be for you a heritage or your inheritance. And so these was a sevenfold blessing given to the Jews in Genesis 12. And Jesus is extending his hand across the water to give it to the Gentiles. Now, the last thing we have to discuss was there were 4,000 Gentiles that were fed and their families. So here in this miracle, when four is applied to the Gentiles, it's also a spiritual number. Four is the number of the four corners of the earth symbolizing this bread was to be broken, was for the whole world, not just the Jews. It also represents the four winds of strife being held back by the four mighty angels. This symbolizes that Jesus is not willing that any should perish, and he will hold back the winds of strife until all have had a chance to repent and learn of him before probation is closed. Four also represents the four names of sin in the Old Testament, sin, transgression, iniquity, and guile. If you read in Psalms 32, the four are mentioned in the first two verses. If you read in Psalms 51, they're mentioned in the first two verses. Uh, the most complete prayer of forgiveness is prayed by King David. He says, cleanse me from my sin, wash me from my iniquities, and blot out my transgressions that there would be no guile found in me. Sin always occurs in this appearing. Even in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement, the priest would atone for the sins, transgressions, and iniquities of Israel. And all three forms of sin are mentioned in the New Testament, and all three forms are given for a name of Satan in the Bible. He's called the man of sin, the mystery of iniquity, and the transgression that maketh desolate. All three are used in references to the little horn power. Jesus is revealing the character of his father. 
that he is able to forgive all kinds and types of sin through the divine sacrifice and offering Jesus was going to give at Calvary. And Jesus looks at his disciples at the end of this, and he says, did you miss it? Did you not see what I was showing you? It's clear as day, isn't it? But he wasn't done. He had one more phase of ministry to do. Jesus was summarizing his miracles. And he asked his disciples, why didn't you understand what I was doing? He later reveals in Mark 14, in verse 22, all that this was going to represent. Remember, he had his ministry to Judea, I mean to Galilee and to Nazareth. Then he had his ministry to Siren, or Sidon and Tyre and Bethsaida. And then he had his ministry to Judea when he rode in on the back of of the donkey. And so there was a closing event that was going to take place. The Lord ended each phase of his ministry with feeding those who were around him. He ended his ministry in Galilee with the feeding of the 5,000 Jews. He ended his ministry to the Gentiles in feeding the 4,000. And he ended the Judean ministry before his crucifixion with feeding his 12 disciples in the upper room. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 22, as they did eat, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given them thanks, he gave it to them and he, they drank it all. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is said for many. He says, did you miss it? We're told in Spirit of Prophecy, the symbols of the Lord's house are simple and plainly understood. And the truths represented by them are of the deepest significance to us. In instituting the sacramental service to take to the place, to take the place of the Passover, Christ left for his church a memorial of his great sacrifice for man. This do, he said, in remembrance of me. This was the point of transition between the two economies and their two great festivals. The one was to close forever, which ended the old covenant. The other, which he had just established, the communion, was to take its place and to continue through all time as a memorial of his death. I want to share I have an audio of the closing scenes of the Bible in Revelation 22, where it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so in closing, we're going to sit. It's a minute and a half. I have the speaker here. I'm going to play it. And I want you to just close your eyes and focus on the words that Jesus has as he reminds us to partake of this communion. So just stay quiet. I'm going to play this, and then we'll have our closing song. <laughs> 